Welcome to the DJE Podcast, where you will learn about real estate investing from real life examples. Here's your host, Devin Elder. Okay, welcome to the show. Today, I'm very excited to have with us Jens Nielsen. Jens is a multifamily investor, has done lots of things as the principal of opendoorscapital.com. So multifamily, self-storage, uh, mobile home parks, GP, LP, we kind of runs the gamut, but uh, we're going to dive into all that today without any further ado. Jens, welcome. How are you? I'm good, Devin. How are you? And uh, happy... Uh... Happy Memorial Day weekend, actually. That's when we're recording this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's I'm, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, no, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm just uh, you know, enjoying, enjoying life here in southwestern Colorado and just been having a great weekend of, of various events and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm doing awesome. Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks for carving out some time to jump on. I, I want to dive in and talk a little bit about your journey. Um, immigrated from Denmark in 1996. You, you know, have, have to have a corporate career, but then you started investing in real estate as well. What, what initially got you uh, interested in real estate and how did you start down that path? Yeah, I realized that, you know, I have a good job and making decent money and saving my 401k, but I also realized that that's not financial freedom. That is working on somebody else's dream and, and you are relying on them to give you a job and pay your you know, paycheck every, every couple of weeks. So while that's been working great for me, I realized if I ever want to retire, if I ever want to have any kind of financial freedom, I got to do something different. And I had, right. you know, had lots of different ideas over the years and looking at what other people have been doing, but it always ended up being another job. Even if you work for yourself, it's still a job. So like, how can I, how can I use some of the capital I've, I've saved up in, and move it into something that's going to generate life, you know, longer term passive income. And that's where, you know, the interest kind of came. I, um, I uh, started actually investing kind of as passively through my, uh, my self-directed IRAs. And I saw like, wow, this is a really great way of getting monthly or, or quarterly cash flow into my retirement accounts. And uh, I was like, okay, well, let's me, let me start investing um, actively too. And, uh, you know, three, four years ago, I started buying some smaller properties, some fourplexes and some smaller properties that I felt like, let me, let me just kind of get my, my feet wet and see how this works out without risking anybody else's capital except my own. And uh, it's done really well since then. That's great. So those fourplexes and those smaller units, those are uh, in your backyard deals that you kind of sourced yourself and financed yourself. So they're, um, they're not in my backyard because I live in a small mountain town in Colorado and it, everything mm -hmm. here is ridiculously expensive so we decided to go to the nearest bigger city it's actually albuquerque new mexico um okay you know three and a half hour drive um uh south of here and i had lived there before so i kind of knew the market and it's much more reasonably priced much better cash flow than you would find around here um and i had some you know reached out to a local guy who was like oh you need to talk to this gentleman he's a broker and he can probably help you find some deals and um uh, you know, within a few months, we found a few different fourplexes and they were reasonably priced, you know, in the 120 to 150 price range. And uh, I was like, oh, this sounds pretty good. And from what I knew of analyzing deals, then I was like, yeah, this is, this is going to work out pretty well. So that's kind of where we started. That's great. So you were able to find a you know, market relatively close by that had good cash flow. How was the, I'm always curious about kind of remote management on smaller properties. Did you guys bring in third party to do that? Or are you driving out there every month? Or how did you guys treat that? Uh, I made the decision, which is kind of been a blessing early on, that I didn't want to try to self-manage because, first right. of all, just, you know, it's class C property. And, you know, the tenant, the tenant class is not always the greatest. So sometimes you have delinquencies, <laughs> you got late rents, you got to post. Yep. There's no way I could do that from here. Um, right. So we just immediately decided to just get professional management in there. And, and, and it's the same. It's a broker that I bought the property through. through. He also has his management company. So it's kind of one-stop shop. Right? He does yeah. his own. He has a big crew of maintenance people and everything else. So they, they pretty much take care of everything. And it's, you know, I've, it's very reasonably priced. I think he charges 10% um, management fee for these smaller properties and no lease up fee and no, you know, no first month rent and all that stuff. So that, from what I've yeah. learned from other markets, this is very reasonable, you know, and they, they take care of all the maintenance. So 
it was it was a blessing. I didn't want to try to deal with that myself. So I do yeah, self manage yeah. some stuff. That's another story. We do own some different type of asset around here that we try to self man self manage, and I've learned that it is it's a lot more work than people initially think. Yeah, that's right. And it's unpredictable work. So, you know, if you work in a W2 job or you've got responsibilities and you're kind of running down that track, you don't know when stuff's going to pop up. You don't know the severity of it. And there's kind of that, that constant hum of the stress of is something going to pop up. And um, I think people try to save money sometimes with a self-managed route. And that's, that's usually a false economy. So good, yeah. good for you for getting started on, on the right foot, especially in a you know, remote market. That's a good move. Yeah, no, you didn't, you know, unless, I mean, if you had a, you know, a one or two single family homes that were class A tenants and stuff like that, and they don't give you any trouble, maybe it could work out, but not for, not for the clients I've been investing in. So. Right. I can definitely relate to you wanting to get into some deals with your own capital and kind of make sure that you could make them perform without, um, you know, using OPM, other people's money. And I kind of started out the same way in my multifamily journey with a small property that I just bought by myself, just me bank just, just to test the water just to make sure you know i could i could handle it um so you, you've done that and those properties have done well what was the trigger point for you to switch over to some of these larger projects and say hey maybe we can partner do a syndication do a bigger deal was there a specific kind of turning point that, that started you down that path for the um, for the bigger property you know I, I very quickly became very motivated to grow quicker and to, hey, I, you know, hopefully my boss is not listening, but I kind of want to get out of my W-2 job eventually, you know, sooner rather than later, because this is, I just really enjoy the, you know, the people I get to meet, you know, somebody like you and everybody else are just really working towards that financial freedom and that entrepreneurship and stuff. And that's a bit yeah. of a mindset shift for me. So when I started, I was like, hey, I need to grow bigger, go quicker. And I think, well, how can I do that? You know, syndications is obviously, you know, one direction a lot of people head in, but I wasn't, didn't quite feel ready for that. And I didn't really feel like I had a profit that made sense for syndication. So I found, um, this is, we, we own about a year now. We found a 38 uh, unit property, also in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, okay. Kind of a beat up. It was in a decent, it was a decent like class B area, but, this, the property was probably like C minus by then because uh, it's been been run down. The, the the owners did not have capital to uh, keep it up to date, and they were just mm -hmm. you know bleeding money and deteriorating pretty quickly. And it was listed for I think one point five one point six million dollars, and we ended up buying it for one point two I think it was. So we kind wow. of beat them up on price. Yeah, and this yeah. is again. So so the way I approached that, I had talked to my my property manager who's become more of a mentor to me now. And he is, I said, do you want to do a bigger deal together? I'd asked him that. And he said, yeah, sure. Cause he's, he's like 73 or 74 years old now, but he just loves this business. And he's like, yeah, I'll do a deal with you. You know? And uh, I said, maybe I can bring some, some friends and family in to do, do like a joint venture on it. Mm -hmm. um, so we, um, we ended up buying this deal a year ago. Um, and we raised, uh, between me and a couple of friends and 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 my partner down there, we we brought six hundred thousand dollars to that deal. Um, and the way the bank, so we you know we paid it one point two million dollars. The bank only gave us six hundred. They only want to do a fifty percent, you know, loan. Oh wow! Suit. Yeah, because they're like, yeah, the this is local, local bank or yeah, uh, yeah, local bank. Yeah, that my partner had a good relationship with. And then they put six hundred thousand dollars aside for um, kind of construction. Sure. So, you know, so they, we had draws on it. So we've gone in there and 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 done all the roofs, all the stucco, the, the deck is a two story building, the decking on the first floor, and then we rehab probably I think forty percent of the units now. Really, like like a lot of uh, heavy rehab, you know, new flooring bathrooms kitchen everything else and the property yeah. just looks amazing compared to what it did it's still a work in progress i think we had 18 months of kind of interest only and uh, you know sort of draw on that and so we're still we're still working away through it's going a little bit slower than i had hoped but there's also that balance between because it was highly occupied because it was it was low rent so um, right 
you know, we're trying to find that balance between rehabbing a few years at a time. I know you've done some pretty hairy deals too, right? And it's that, that balance, right? <laughs> it's a balancing act. Yeah, because, you know, you see that 98% occupancy, you go, oh, wow, this is great. But, you know, there's a reason. It's, yeah. It's a balancing act, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because the old, the old owners were, you know, paying all the utilities and just, yep. just not managing it well. So, so now we're, you know, moving utilities batting into the tenants names and we're raising rents and we're getting a much better tenant class in there and delinquencies are dealt with so it's it's pretty exciting i think once we once we have said and done i think we'll have maybe half a million dollars worth of equity in that deal you know just to force excellent to work we've done so that's that's pretty exciting so that was a great yeah on a deal that 38 units half a million dollars of equity that's tremendous and so you're using the same um, team basically the broker and the property management company to even use on those smaller properties and you kind of just scaled that up or is that a different yeah thing? and yeah basically just partner with him and you know right. so, <laughs> so his his interests are aligned with with ours in the sense that he has right into it you know, obviously he makes money on he makes money on the on the management and on the rehab and sure. everything else so, yeah let him i mean that's great <laughs> <laughs> if you can kind of uh, uh, delegate those pieces. I mean, those are very hands-on, um, sensitive pieces. I mean, if you're doing rehabs and they got to be done quick and, and they got to be done right, you got to lease them up. So there's a, there's a lot to that. You can pay somebody competent to take care of that and take it off your plate. That's definitely a win. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and again, you know, just talking about Albuquerque, most people may not be very familiar with that market. I mean, you're in, you're in Texas, so it's not too far from you guys, but Right. It's one of these markets that has kind of flown under the radar for a long time. Interesting. You know, it didn't, it took a very long time to recover from the last recession. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but, but it's a lot of, a lot of really interesting things been happening. You know, Facebook is opening it or have opened a, a big data center just south of the city. Oh, Netflix, actually. Yeah. Netflix actually bought, there's some movie uh, studios there. Netflix bought them six or eight months ago and making that day kind of the North American production headquarters. Wow. Uh, and then there's the, you know, Sandia Labs is one of the biggest, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, research facilities there. And they're, they announced they're going to hire 2000 more people in the next couple of years. So there's a lot of very interesting things going on in kind of the tertiary. I mean, it's still a big city. There's over a million people in the tertiary market right after all. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's some positive, um, Demographic or oh, a positive shift there that I'm excited about. That makes sense. So yeah, I'm not that familiar with Albuquerque. We kind of focus on our backyard. So just to keep things simple, I, we we don't even look at deals outside our backyard because we have enough going on here. Um, so you picked up that property in the like low 30s a door. Is that is that right? Yeah, 35 something like that. I think you know. Yeah. And what what are cap rates kind of trading at for that type of asset class in, in Albuquerque? Have they been compressed like everywhere else? Yeah, you know, it's when I started buying like three or four years ago, the smaller properties were, you know, seven and a half to eight cap, you know, but now, mm -hmm. to be honest, I have not really followed the market very closely because we're so focused on working on this deal. But I think now, sure. you know, six, you know, six or seven, eh, yeah. six and that's um, the other thing I've seen, there's some, you know, anything larger or is selling at a much lower cap rate for some reason. You know, a lot of those are like selling at a hundred thousand dollars a door, which I'm like, you can't really make those numbers work. So I'm not sure. Right. I guess that's out of state, you know, California money coming in or somewhere else trying to, you know, find a market that has some still some upside and they're going in there and, and I think it might have been an overpaying for them. Sure. Yeah, I think we're definitely seeing a lot of that here in San Antonio as well, where you kind of lose out a deal and scratch your head on being off by like millions of dollars <laughs> on, the, on the offer price like how is the next guy getting there but uh they are so you know you just yeah. have to uh have to just kind of bake that into your expectations that there's going to be some out-of-state buyers that uh have different criteria than than us sometimes and yeah. that's fine yeah. yeah maybe some of that will come back in a few years and yeah i'm sure i'm sure <laughs> some of it will um that's good so that's that's a, a great I love hearing the story of kind of the, the progress through wanting to achieve financial freedom to buying smaller properties to scaling that up. And then since then, you've been a part of, uh, of some much larger syndications, partnering with different people, deals around the country, or what was the, what was kind of the next, um, how did you get into partnering on some of these larger syndications? 
Yeah. So what I realized, you know, when I started out, I didn't really know what I didn't know. So I, uh, right. I think to step back, I, I, uh, I signed up for, you know, I realized I need some education. I need some peers and mentors and other things. So I kind of, you know, I signed up for like a mentoring coaching program. Um, right. And that group has really elevated my, my peer group. It has, it has brought me around people that are doing bigger things. And, you know, that idea of once you, once you align yourself with people that are ahead of you, if you will, you either have to live up to their expectations or not be part of that group anymore. Right. Right. So I, I, I specifically decided to, well, let me try to align myself with people that are doing bigger things because then I will try to push myself harder. Um, and, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to, uh, I had kind of indicated the interest in maybe raising money because I, I, you know, I spent the last two or three years talking to everybody that wanted to stand still and said, hey, I'm a multifamily investor. If I ever have a deal, would you be interested in investing with me? And a lot right. of people have, you know, expressed that interest. But I didn't have anything that really made sense to syndicate. And I just didn't, well, I, I just weren't able to find a deal myself with my limited resource. Like, well, let me, let, let me uh, partner with some experienced syndicators let me bring money to the table and then thereby allowing you know my network to invest in a deal kind of through me and, and, and facilitate that that connection but I think you know as you know it's an inefficient market especially if you're doing you know a 506 B where you can't advertise finding those investors and connecting them with the with the with the syndicator is not always simple so right. um so yeah, so early in the year, you know, through through some of my my peers in 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 you know, mentorship group, they they had this deal and said, uh, "Hey, I'd love to help you raise money." I said, "I don't know what I can and can't do," um, and this is a two hundred and twelve unit deal in um, in Dallas, sorry, uh, in uh, in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I I came in kind of late, uh, had a, you know, it's like we're gonna raise the money and we're gonna close in two weeks. I was like, "Oh, okay, well, let me see what I can do." And I reached out to some people and within like seven days, I had $350,000 committed and people actually committed and wired the money. So right. that, was a, that was a good test of my network and, uh, and the approach. So I really felt that was a, a really success. For me. Yeah, that's tremendous. And there, you, you bring up a good point about, I think uh, there's a lot of times with these multifamily deals, the pie is, is pretty big, right? Which is great because you, you can bring on a team and everybody can kind of win. But for, for yourself, you've got limited resources in terms of time on your W-2, um, but you've, you've got a network and there's some value there. And then for the operator, they've got limited time on investor relations, basically, because as an operator, you know, us as an operator, we're, we're constantly underwriting deals we're constantly touring deals and we're losing absolutely almost all of them right and that's just how it goes to find deals I and mean, you have yeah. to look at a ton of deals you have to tour a ton of deals ton of offers that's very time intensive and so for an operator to be able to partner with some people to basically kind of handle a piece of that investor relations is really valuable so that's a symbiotic relationship that i've just seen work well over and over and over again and allows somebody like you and in, in a limited time w2 position to to be a part of a big deal and allow the operator to shed some of that investor relations um uh work and everybody can kind of come together and make it work so that's a that's a beautiful model and i love hearing that you're able to do that um and have success with that while while having a w2 job because that's a common question right how do i get into these big deals without doing everything. And I don't advocate that you go out and you do everything. It's too much work to, to go and take it all down yourself. No, I totally agree. And you know, as you, when you start understanding how the general partnership is, is kind of divided up, divided up between people that find a deal, underwrite the deal, you know, sign on the loan, bring the net worth, raising money, asset management. There's so many, that pie is split up in many different ways, right? And, and and I think it's, it is beneficial to everybody involved, right? If you, somebody like you go and say, Hey, I have a network of people that can raise money. I didn't need to focus on find the deal and operate the deal, right? It, it helps. It, and it's a, it's such, that's what I really love about the real estate investing. There's so many different ways that you can help each other and you can you know, make money and you, you don't have to control everything. And I think that's, that's, I think that's a mindset shift too, from owning you know, some, some smaller units where you do everything yourself and you kind of get stretched out by the whole thing versus, Hey, what am right. I good at? What do I enjoy doing? And I've actually 
I enjoy having the, these investor conversations. You know, I, I am actually going to meet a friend this afternoon to talk about it. And it's, it, I enjoy it and I'm an analytical person. I can actually explain, I can, I can explain the operating, uh, the OM and I can talk to people and, you know, I think in an intelligent way about why it makes sense to invest in, in, in multifamily and all the tax right. benefits and the long-term growth of equity and the cash flow and everything. So it's, it's just a, it suits me well, actually. And I, I, I'm surprised that I, how much I enjoy doing that. So that's pretty awesome. Right. Yeah. You mentioned kind of finding what you are good at and you enjoy. And it's interesting how I've kind of seen that over the years too. I've kind of gravitated towards certain pieces of the business where my strengths are. And if you've got a natural strength, with something, you know, you should double down on it because uh, it's kind of thing you can do more of and be successful at and then find partners or whatever it is to handle the things that you're not uh, the best at. And that's, um, that's a real key for, for success. I think in any business is figure out what your superpower is and, and keep doubling down on that. So that's, yeah. that's tremendous. Yeah. <clears throat> and then it also, so being part of this, you know, a uh, very experienced team then brought me, I, I connected with another um, operator who uh, has done a couple of smaller syndications, but he, uh, he got a 205 unit deal on a contract. Um, and, you know, I was like, Hey, can I help you here? Cause he had done everything kind of locally and had, you know, investors locally that, you know, I can bring you, I can bring investors from the outside. And I actually got more involved in helping him structure the deal and, 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 you know, really getting some of the systems in place around, you know, investor portals and everything else. So I was quickly able to help him um, kind of scale his business through some of my own experience. And that was really helpful too, because I, you know, sometimes you don't know what you don't know and you bring in right. other people who has done it and has seen stuff. And, and so that's been, that's something we're working on currently. And that's been super exciting to, um, to bring some value to that team through my own experience and uh, just my own kind of studying and everything else. So that's, that's kind of the thing that's going on right now. And uh, so it's, uh, it's just, and sometimes that snowball just keeps growing and things move right. quicker than you expect. And it's like, Oh my God, there's so many, so many things that suddenly happen. Right. You start seeing opportunities and then, you know, that, that can be very rewarding too. Right. I mean, talk a little bit about that about, and, and I know we kind of wanted to touch on some of the coaching that you do now too, but beyond kind of the financial, you know, tax benefits and equity and the, you know, the money piece of it, which is obviously very important. There's kind of this aspect of, of helping people that, you know, are in a situation that maybe you were in two, three years ago. How has that experience been for you? Kind of the coaching and mentoring of folks and, and bringing them, bring them along in the business. Um, yes. I mean, just kind of maybe wrapping up this, the money raising and syndication uh, thing. I mean, I don't really, trust the stock market <laughs> and right. you know, okay. I've been through I've been through all the ups and downs or whatever and I think having a, a balanced portfolio or something where you are less of sex, uh, you know at risk of those market sentiments um, and then also get all these you know tax benefits write-offs and, and depreciation and everything else so you know I've, I've I've tried to explain that to people that don't necessarily understand it versus just you know having taxable gains on your stock portfolio that it's holding real estate for a long time and have all kinds of tax benefits. So that's another real good aspect of that. And it's, you know, right. the just pass through to the passive investors. So, so that's great. Um, and then maybe move on to <clears throat> like the coaching and stuff, you know, I'm, uh, um, I felt for a couple of reasons, I feel like if you have to teach somebody else how to do something, you better be, good at it right you, it, it, it's, yes. it's kind of one of these things it forces you to really think about all those questions a, a begin or somebody getting into the into the business may have you know so i've i've, I've had the opportunity to um to coach newer real estate investors through through the program I was involved in and um and that's been really rewarding i mean i've had some people that you know didn't really maybe they own some properties themselves, but they didn't really think again beyond that. Okay. I can buy a fourplex or a duplex and stuff. And they never really thought beyond that. What does it take to take it to the next level? Right. And I was like, right. Well, think about it. Just kind of, I think coaching is really one thing is 
the mechanics of it, which you can read in books and listen to podcasts and learn a lot about that. But I think just having that uh, accountability and setting goals and being, you know, just trying to achieve those goals. If you have a coach asking you every week, every other week, so did you achieve, did you call the 10 brokers and did you talk to 10 investors and whatever it is? And, and if you have somebody else keeping you accountable, it's, it's, you, you get stuff done versus just being accountable to yourself or not. <laughs> so that's been, that's kind of been the, the direction I've taken. In doing that. Yeah, that, that's great. You mentioned peer group earlier, and that has such a, a tremendous impact, positive or negative. I mean, I think a lot of people don't purposely choose their peer group and they kind of end up with the peer group maybe through work, which is a lot of times, you know, that you have no control over it. And a lot of times it just might not be the right group. But we just, uh, as social animals, we just tend to mimic our peer group. It's a very simple but a very profound shift to purposefully choose to change your peer group. You know, a couple of years ago, I did that by joining basically two different very high level peer groups. One was for multifamily specific and one was more general, but I mean, it's completely changed my life in, in every way because you, you just unconsciously start to mimic the peer group and then you have that new set of standards that say wow these guys really wouldn't they really wouldn't put up with that and um i better i better get my act together <laughs> that's, a, that's a powerful effect and so you're able to hold people accountable what are some things that you've seen with your coaching students um that maybe you could share here that have been helpful for them kind of going through that transition and you know kind of taking their real estate investing career to the next level. Are there some kind of recurring themes that you see have helped people along? I think the first one is really just setting goals. What are you trying mm -hmm. to achieve, right? Uh, you, you know, are you perfectly happy in your job or you just want to build a small portfolio on the side or do you want to, you know, be able to leave your job in a few years, right? So I think really just having specific measurable goals. Uh, that's, I think that's the first thing. I think we should all, I mean, we should all sit down several times a year, even several times a month or weekly and look at what are your one. I mean, I don't like to look at, you know, five, 10 years out because it's, right. it's really hard. I mean, I know kind of, but it's hard to really be very specific because your life, we underestimate what we can do in five to 10 years and overestimate what we can do in a year. Uh, so I try to look at, you know, one or two years, what do I want to be, right? And just kind of break it down. And that's the first exercise every time I get with a new student. I said, okay, what are the five top goals you're trying to achieve here in the next one, two, maybe three years? And really get people to think about that and say, you know, mm -hmm. and also, why are you doing this? What, what is the, right. what are you trying to achieve here, right? And if you don't have a compelling, if you don't have a compelling why behind it and compelling goals, when you know, when things don't go right, you may, um, you may just uh, give up and say, ah, let me go on, right? Versus where you say, hey, I can achieve financial freedom for me and my family in two years, and I can see my kids grow up and spend time with them, whatever it is, right? If you have that strong why behind it, I think that's really the, the, the starting point. And then we kind of, you know, we try to break that down into small actionable steps. Are you going to go and find your own deals? Are you going to connect with the brokers? Are you going to do all that work yourself or are you more like hey i want to maybe get part of a syndication on the lp side first and then kind of learn from that and then go to the, to the dp side whatever it is just i'm not here to tell you what you should do you have to discover that for yourself and where your strengths are and again that idea of playing to your strengths um mm -hmm. don't try to do it all yourself because yeah you can buy a fourplex but you can't run a 200 apartment complex by yourself so uh, yep yeah, that's great feedback. I love that. And I think that's really important. That's, I, I get a lot of questions from people. Hey, what should I do, you know, to get started in multifamily real estate? And my question is always, well, what's the outcome? Because <laughs> if your outcome is to, I say the answers are, there's so many answers to give somebody, but where, where do you want it to take you? You know, do you, you want to run a thousand doors as this primary sponsor? Do you want to have so mailbox money where you don't have to do anything. I mean, there's a million different ways to take it. You have to define that first and then reverse engineer that. And I love, I love looking one to two years out because there are so many variables, things are going to change. But if you set a 12, 18, 24 month goal, you can really reverse engineer that down to the, 
It sounds so simple, but I, I think a lot of people aren't doing that. You reverse engineer it down to what, what are the steps you can take today and um, start, start attacking those. And the network and the education is such a huge, huge part of that because meeting the right person or getting the right partnership in place, that can just completely change your trajectory and, and catapult things. Absolutely. And sometimes just try to bring value, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you, you're a new investor and it's like, oh, but I don't have anything to offer. Well, we all have unique skills to offer, right? So what can you do to, what can you do to assemble a peer group of people that are at a you know, perceived higher level than you? I mean, mm -hmm. one thing I did, I just said, hey, I connected with some people that I had met at events and I said, okay, these are people doing things that I would like to do. Why don't we get together on a monthly basis? We have a Zoom call, we just talk about where we at and I just set it up and I send invites out and stuff. And that was enough. They all felt like that was worthwhile their time to bring them together. Sure. You know, and that's some of these, some of these connections that I wouldn't expect in these, you know, this, this growth, just from doing that relatively simple thing. But it's just about taking action, getting outside your comfort zone and trying to provide some sort of value to whomever it is, right? Yeah, that's such a great point because you're, you're really, uh, people think that their value has to be a giant balance sheet or giant net worth or ton of experience. And you're talking about just facilitating, mm -hmm. you, you know, you're facilitating something and that's creating value for people. So that's, uh, that's a great point and a great takeaway for people is you want to focus on how you can add value to people in your network, um, prospective partners, all of that. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a dollar amount. That's a, that's a great insight. I appreciate that. Yeah, sure. Um, and you know, <clears throat> also the other thing, don't be afraid of asking, right? I mean, mm -hmm. as, and I keep saying to students and stuff like that, you know, don't be afraid of rejection because, reje you know, if you ask somebody, Hey, you know, Devin, can I come out and hang out with you for a couple of days and see your tool properties? And if you say no, I have not lost anything. I'm not any worse yeah. off, right? If you say right. yes, well, suddenly I, you know, that can bring me to whatever the next level, right? So I think just that, yep. just asking people for what you want, I mean, it sounds kind of selfish, but that's really just the way we can move up. And, you know, if you have to ask a hundred people, and maybe three will say yes to something you want, well, then you've achieved that. And I think that's also a, you know, we sit in our little world of, of, of being afraid of stepping outside, outside that comfort zone, everything else, mm -hmm. and I think just pushing ourselves. And, you know, I was the guy sitting behind the computer screen because I'm an IT professional for years. And the stuff I'm doing now I would not have imagined that I would do a few years ago, just right. <laughs> becoming a different person along the way. Right. So that's, that's, that's just that growth is amazing. And I, I really try to instill that in my students to get outside your comfort zone, call up people, you know, just whatever it takes. Right. And you'll get a bunch of no's, but that's okay. You, you're not any worse off. Right. Right. Yeah. That's just a great point. You have to build that muscle too, because where you are now versus relative to where you started, it was a series of maybe a thousand steps and, and there, it wasn't one big leap, right? It was, you, you take one step, you're out of your comfort zone, then you get a good result. And then you realize from that new vantage point, Hey, okay, I did that. What's the next kind of tiny incremental improvement that I can do. And then you get to that point and things look different. And that's, um, that's how you do it. And then you look back over, you know, the last couple of years ago, wow, that's a, that's a big change in my trajectory, but it was, it was small steps along the way that, that anybody can take. And sometimes people just need permission to, to do that. They just need to hear from somebody just like them that they did it. And, and that's part of that, uh, that's part of that positive mindset shift that you get from being aligned with the, the right peer group. So yeah, love it. And also that idea of, you know, we see people that are successful and we're like, oh my God, look at this guy or, or girl, whatever they've achieved this amazing success. Mm -hmm. But we don't, we don't know, we want to be there, but we don't know how to get there. So we never start because right. we can't see that. We can't see the road ahead of us to get there. Right. You know, and, and we, everybody has realized, you know, most people did not, they started from somewhere that maybe similar to where you are. And if you can just, you know, keep keeping the long-term goal in mind, but just take steps along the way towards that direction. Right. And, and correct as things doesn't work out. You know? Just that, that continue small improvements along the way. Um, that's, that's what I really like. Um, I've read some, you know, some books around that and just 
we just got to keep moving forward, right? And, and right. obstacles coming our way, well, that's just, we either go over or through or, <laughs> you know, just, just learning from that. So, yeah. yeah, that's right. You, you realize it after any amount of studying it, that somebody that's achieved whatever result you're seeing has gone through a tremendous amount of challenges and they just kind of keep overcoming that. And it's also important to realize that you're looking at kind of the external end result yeah. um, of, you know, when somebody shares on social media, Hey, we closed this 250 unit property, you know, you might go, wow, that's, um, that's this huge deal. And I could never do that. But behind the scenes, there's tons of work, partnerships, lots of growth, lots of intentional pursuing of these things. And, um, and it's, it's doable. You just have to get on the path and start. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So the whole mindset well, thing that that's just the biggest, the biggest thing I, I believe in being successful is, is having the right mindset and don't let setbacks derail you and, and don't just, you know, give up and everything else. And that's, Right. Yeah. Keep, keep after it. And, and, and back to the peer group that or uh, some sort of accountability partner or coach that has a huge impact there on um, on, on staying, you know, staying on the track and, and keep taking the next step. Yeah. I love it. Well, Jens, thank you so much for, for sharing your story here. If somebody wants to reach out and connect and learn more about what you're up to and, and what, what you have going on, what's the best place for folks to do that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, they can uh, email me at Jens, was spelled J E N S, at opendoorscapital.com. So J E N S at opendoorscapital.com. Yeah, I love to talk Great. to anybody and reach out, you know, uh, and sometimes I, you know, schedule calls with people that want to learn more or whatever. So yeah, I love to share and everything else. It's been yeah. awesome. Great. Well, to connect with you again. We we appreciate you sharing here with the audience. Um, love hearing the story and, and what you're up to and look forward to connecting with you soon. Uh, maybe we can have you on the podcast in another year and we can talk about all the, all the progress of the last, uh, you know, the last year, but thanks so much for your time. Jens. we'll connect soon. Thanks. Evan. See you soon. All righty. Take care. Thank you for listening to the DJE podcast. For more information, please go to djetexas.com.